Okay. Am I already? I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so let's start now. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome Snehanshu Saha to IAA. He's a, 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 not a, a known person here. He's been coming here for many years, collaborating with me, uh, Jayant Mukti, Margarita, and others. And so I, so I think this is the first time, right, that you're giving a talk here. <laughs> um, so let me introduce him formally. So um, Dr. Shaha, or Professor Shaha is a faculty associate professor at Goa with Sulami campus. He's in the Department of Computer Science. He completed a PhD from the University of Texas at Arlington in Computer Science. And uh, briefly, he was in PES University here in Bangalore, and now he's in Goa this campus. He's also the center director or coordinator of the Anuradha and Prashant Palakukti Center for Artificial Intelligence Research. Uh, so, uh, Sehanshu is the, the expert whom I always turn to for machine learning and all kinds of artificial intelligence related to data, and I'm really looking forward to this talk. Thank so, you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Shruti. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So, um, you know, all these AI guys like us who are you know, artificially intelligent and naturally stupid, um, here's something. Um, so, uh, there's a little bit of history as we go at, um, I mean, as, as, as I get into the top, main topic of it. At the same time, I'd like to tell you that because of the um, diverse nature of the audience, um, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritties of the algorithms per se. Rather, I will give you the founding snippets and the motivation of the algorithm and how we applied it to um, different problems. So, as you can see, um, I had collaborators in this, one of which is Margarita Sapnova, you know her, and Jyotin Moy as a PhD student who just submitted his thesis, and then Professor Santanu Sarkar, who is right now at ABD Corporate. So apart from Margarita, none of the other three are physicists, right? So, um, and that can be fun. Um, uh, okay, also, um, what we tried to do in the beginning, I mean, Exoplanet was actually not on the horizon. I mean, we had no idea that, um, you know, this would probably range to exoplanets. So now when I look back to this particular piece of work, um, I do think the extension to exoplanets is a validation of the generalization ability of the method that is proposed. Okay, so let me give you the motivation of the method where it came from. By the way, um, I mean, if, if we can make this interactive, I think it's better. Uh, what is your perception of anomaly? Do you know what is an anomaly? How do we define anomalies? Um, if I give you a data set, can you quantify? Outlier out of the distribution points, yes, right. But um, is there an upper bound? Can we quantify the number of data points as anomalous? If it's so, in general, the thumb rule is given a large enough data set, right? If about 10% of the data set you would expect to be different from the distribution, okay? All right. However, there are questions like what happens if 40% of the data set is anomalous? In that case, it's not an anomaly detection problem. It becomes an imbalanced classification problem where you have one class of data points, which is 60% of the data, and the other class, which is 40% of the data set. In such cases, this method will not work. Okay, I'm being upfront about it. Won't work. Um, now, in the social context, I mean, it's just this, the social context. Can we? Um, can we just think a little bit about how anomalies affect us? Just in the social context, not in not in the engineering or science. Even the way we see journalism around us. It's out of the box. I mean, in terms of journalism. Okay, I'll give you an example. So here is this. Okay, so here is this guy from this particular university who graduated, right? And his pay package is one five years. He's a and you would see institutions advertise that, right? So counter question is, is that the median salary of your graduating class? No, it's not, right? 
how many in your graduating class have secured a job of that one? The answer would be actually one out of hundred, right? But when you see the news, so that anomaly is projected. So it's just one data point that is projected, okay? And the problem with this kind of reporting is it violates the statistical principle that anomalous data instances are not anomalous, they're actually a trend. I'll give you another example. Um, Bill Gates is a college dropout. Or this guy, this random guy is a college dropout and now he's a multimillionaire, okay? Turns out this guy is a Harvard dropout, right? Not a dropout from Kormangala Institute of Technology. Okay, and the point is, and then there are also instances in physics, right, where people did not have PhDs, but went on and became very good researchers. I think, I forgot the names. There are a couple of instances, right? Freeman Dyson, right? But does it mean that, you know, how many in this room is another Freeman Dyson? I don't know, right? So does it mean that we do not require formal training in order to have a successful career in research, right? So those are anomalous data points. So when you teach in the anomaly as a standard or a normal instance, there are multiple problems. So one of the other problems that we make all the time in evaluation, because that's our trade, right? Um, so let's say in this room, we are in this room and all of us are drawing some form of salary, hopefully, right? And then this guy, Bill Gates, walks in. Okay, so before he walked in, I could actually compute an average salary, right? And that number would be representative, right? The moment he walks in and I weigh in his salary, add everything up, recompute the average, do you think that the new number that I'm going to get will be representative of the data set in the room? No. Right? So what you should be never doing when you are reporting such things is that the average, right? Because you are treating and the other thing you should not be doing is to treat an anomalous data instance as a normal data instance, okay? And then it leads to sort of statistical misconceptions and completely wrong reporting, which is what people do all the time, right? Okay, uh, institutions do it to their advantage when they want to attract students and so on and so forth. Right. I mean, I haven't yet seen an institution which reports median salary of the graduating class. Because that kinds of tells you where the ballpark is. Okay. Anyway, so so these are these are anomalies in the context of as we see it. So sometimes it so happens that in an instance of like one million instance and in a set of one million instances, there are one or two anomalies. Sometimes we have several, right? Uh, in the context of exoplanets, when we come back to exoplanets, you will see that in the context of exoplanets, out of 4,500 instances, about 45 anomalies. Okay. Uh, anyway, um, so how do we? Um, so, so, the, so the question is, where did this come from? Okay. So you know where I, where I come from. My background is that we try to solve optimization problems. In fact, I was talking to Swastik before the talk, and he was asking me. Um, so here is what, how we evolved. We were first trying to solve a multi-objective optimization problem, which was this, that there are a bunch of taxis that I need to talk to. Okay, a pool of taxis, there are a bunch of customers, and I'm only considering the purely share riding option. Pretty pool, pool cap services, whether it's Ola, whether it's Uber, it doesn't matter. Now, when I do that, as a customer, I have several constraints, right? Like, for example, how long I'm willing to wait before the cab is booked, how long I'm willing to wait after the cab is booked, what is my total, you know, detour distance, et cetera, et cetera. For the cab driver, there are several utility objectives that he or she has to pull, right? I mean, if I pick the second customer after I pick the first customer, if I pick the second one, then how much detour I have to go, right? Whether that's a congested, the road or blah 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 all that right and based on that a satisfactory resolution has to be made so that your request is honored shared right so as you can see for both type of users the customer as well as the cab driver there are more than one objectives to solve okay so these are non-classical optimization problems where you have multiple objectives to solve simultaneously and arrive at a satisfactory solution so your solution is never optimal like it's not like taking the minimum or maximum of y is equal to x square. 
So that's a classical optimization problem. Okay. Now we uh, so so there's a history in literature, history of literature actually, to attempt solving these kind of problems by using some sort of meta heuristic colony type optimization. They can't colony optimization, particle swarm optimization, genetic programming, right? Okay. So so when we approach this problem, my PhD student, and then um, we devised an algorithm which we are eventually going to use in the detection of exoplanets is called multi-stage mimetic algorithm. Okay, all right. So what is the main we'll come to this? What is the main? Anyone? Mimetic algorithm came from me, right? So what is it? It could be imitation. That's a secondary meaning. I think when I looked it up, the primary meaning is that it is some sort of a cross-cultural evolution that happens, right? Okay. So, so the idea was this: that okay, here is the parent, father and the mom, and then there is an offspring, right? And then there are assuming that communities mix well, right? Okay. So there is cross-cultural evolution, and there are operat operations such as mutation and crossover. So crossover is reproduction, mutation is you just have a sequence of bits, you change one bit at random. If you do that, you know, it mutates, right? I mean, it changes, it, you have a new expression, correct? So using these operations, and the idea is in the context of social sciences, that if you mix well with other communities, okay, interact with them, right? And when an offspring comes out of it, hopefully that guy is a better citizen, okay? So there is this cross-cultural evolution that is integrated into this metaheuristic optimization problems that make some of these solutions more efficient than others. Okay, so we we propose this algorithm, multi-stage genetic algorithm, which is based on you know basically a re-engineered version of the genetic algorithm to solve this particular problem. So the taxi problem is more or less solved. Did we get an optimal solution? No. The answer is no. You can never get an optimal solution. Then what happened was that these anomalies happened in the sense that Jyotimai comes from GE Healthcare. Now GE Healthcare is a company which makes large industrial grade medical devices, PET scanners and all that sort, right? And they have huge amount of log data, huge. So what they were interested to know is that from the log data, and of course there is some history in the log data, and from the domain knowledge of the GE guys, they knew that out of this huge amount of log data, some were anomalies. But what they wanted to do was to not to use the labels. So you flag one particular row as an anomaly, right? But you don't want to use that level. Okay, so that knowledge comes to you in a sort of an unsupervised fashion. You use that to figure out whether I have new instances, once again, hundreds and millions of new instances, can you devise a method which can flag the anomaly? Okay, why are they interested in doing so? The reason why they're interested in doing so is that there is no reward for ensuring that your machines run smoothly, but there is a huge penalty when it does. So the cost is huge. So another instance is a G makes boiler plates, industrial grade boilers. In the, if the boiler plate goes off, it's a, typically a cost of a billion dollars. When does the boiler plate go off? Once in 10 years. Once in 10 years, 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, it's really And that's why these instances are anomalous. So you understand how difficult it is to detect such instances because it happens rarely. Okay, of course, not that all anomalies are equals. So here comes the different types of anomaly. So the first one, what is what we call as a point anomaly. So what is it? So typical customer spending, right? So I spend, let's say on an average, I spend 10, 50 rupees a day using my credit card, right? One particular day I have spent 5,000. So for the automated algorithms that credit card companies run, it will flag it as an anomaly. Then probably you, might, you might have encountered this that you did that on one day and within half an hour a call comes. 
how an immediate yeah almost immediate right the call comes saying the customer care guy from the credit card company ask you are you this person why do they do that because most anomaly detection algorithms carry the burden of a huge number of false positives which they want to reduce so i don't want to detect non anomalous instances as anomalous instances because if i do that if i am if i'm running a credit card business i'm actually annoying my customers they want to reduce that okay at the same time they don't want to they don't want to miss the true detection i mean they it has to detect when whenever there is an anomaly right okay so this is a point anomaly this one is a contextual anomaly if you if you look carefully you will see um, this is a point For this one, okay. yeah. No, this is this is perhaps my uh, you know clumsiness. <laughs> so it's just nothing to do with it. This is fine. This is working fine. No anomalies. So you can see uh, if you if you follow this trend, right? I mean, you have sort of sinusoids everywhere, and then somewhere over here, it's like it started behaving like a sinusoid, but then rapidly crashed. Okay. So in the context, this is a contextual anomaly rather than a point anomaly. Okay. So it could be like you know during festive seasons people spend more, right? Compared to you know non-festive seasons. So there's like a flat thing, right? And so on and so forth. And then there is a collective anomaly. What is that? once again going back to the spending? So if there is an anomalous um, event, like an anomalous spending on not only on the fourth day. But on the fifth day as well, it could be anomalous, right? It may not be anomalous, it may be anomalous. So this is like a collective anomaly because it's not a single instance. In the time series, it has like it's happening two days at a time. Okay. All right. Um, there are other things, like for example, intrusion detection cases where you are trying to copy files um, from a remote server to your local machine. So what when you do that, you are actually the uh, Let's think of this as a distributed denial of service attack where you're trying to copy multiple files to your home location, home system from a remote location, right? So the entry points to the system are at multiple. So it's not a, at, a, at a particular point, but at multiple points. These are different types of anomalies. Um, and as I was telling you, the cost is huge. I mean, in fact, these numbers are not that important. I mean, I'm not even sure, um, you know, how reliable these numbers are. But let's say this is a ballpark. Like the cost of not being able to detect anomalous instances is about 13 million, billion, 13 billion US dollars. Okay, which is a three times jump from uh, you know uh, what you are, what you were, where you were in 2018. Okay. Um, now, before I lose you, so let's bring in examples. So we are talking about anomalies in industrial systems. Right? And then, of course, there are credit cards are not industrial systems, so they are just customer businesses. So my interest primarily was when I designed an algorithm and it worked well, let's say, supposedly on industrial systems, then we try and see whether it works well on non-industrial data sets as well, like credit card fraud detection, et cetera, et cetera, right? Can I apply it to some other domain and therefore establish the generalization ability of the this was the inspiration. Okay. And then Margarita happened. And so we thought all our previous attempts at exoplanet classification based on the PHLEC data were based on supervised languages, which means what? That I have the catalog, right? I have the levels, the cycloplanets, mesoplanets, mesocycloplanets, and the non habitable ones. These are catalogs, right? And for against the name of each exoplanet, there are levels. So what you do, you sort of design a classification scheme and try to see if I inject a new entry, whether your algorithm is able to classify it in one of the three classes. The trouble is these levels are primarily dependent on surface temperature. The cycro and the meso, right? Because that's how these levels are actually done in PHLC. It follows the temperature threshold. If it's above the temperature threshold or below the temperature threshold, they leveled it. And this was the catalog by Abel Mendes. I mean, 
at the, at the PHLS. So therefore, what your machine learning classification algorithm should really behave as multiple feature marker, not as just one feature marker. So if you are training your model based on just one feature, you are actually not, your method is, I mean, your, your machine is not learning anything. Because you already know that, okay, if the surface temperature is greater than, let's say, 100 degrees centigrade, 150 degrees centigrade, this is just this level. If it is less than, this is the, that level and that. Why do we need machine learning for? We tried recalibrating the method by removing surface temperature and all other features related to surface temperature, like flux and things like that. Okay, but when we did that, in the supervised sense, the performance dropped drastically, obviously, right? Because your levels are um, learned, the way the levels are learned is because of those values and the surface temperature. So this doesn't, this is not really the classification approach with whether you use a classical machine learning algorithm or deep learning algorithm, it's not very useful. So we can't, yes. Yes. Okay. All the parameters that PHLEC had, I think they're like 68, and we some of those parameters were identified, so we removed them. So we had escape velocity, eccentricity, and everything. Okay. Mm, we didn't do that. When I said we remove temperature, we remove temperature and surface and flux and those things. We did not do that. Do that. Okay. I doubt that because see the levels are surface temperature based. That's how the levels are curated. So I don't expect the algorithm to behave any better, right? Um, even if I drop just the radius. Anyway, and then there are some profile-based approaches, one plus support information and so on. And so these are some of the benchmarks that are available. Okay, which are used in industrial and non-industrial systems so far. Um, each one has its own merits and its demerits and etc. Um, but the point is this. So when I look at this catalog, now that catalog is gone actually. That catalog does not exist, it's gone. Okay, in 2022, it doesn't exist. When I look at this catalog, I have no idea. And I asked Abel Mendes, and he said that they are probably aligning it with the NASA um, the exoplanet archive and things like that, and some of the things were not right. And this is, I mean, that's the response that I got from him. So he actually pulled it up from his website. Yeah, it doesn't exist in the PHL, you know, the yeah, University of Puerto Rico's um, exoplanet archive. Anyway, so the point is, so out of these, let's say, 4,500 odd planets, you know. If you go to that particular site, you will see that there are, you know, an optimistic list of exoplanets, and there's a potential list of exoplanets. So the, the optimistic list is about 60, and the potential is about 40, something like that, if I get the numbers correct out of those. Um, they arrived at that number based on some physical parameters, based on the hard science, right? What we wanted to do is sort of able to reproduce that using just the data-centric algorithm. So what we thought at that point was that, okay, look, most of these, when I look at the catalog, most of these are non-habitables, right? Most of the planets are non-habitables, right? The only habitable instance that we know is Earth, where we live in, right? Okay. And maybe there are some potential candidates, which may or may not be habitable, okay? So your possibility of having a set of habitable planets, the ratio compared to the total number of planets is really small. Okay, therefore, can we make an equivalent problem and say that if I detect anomalous instances from the catalog, I'm also detecting habitable ones. It's just a mapping that we did. There is no theoretical proof. It's just a hunch based on which we started working. So, and the reason why I wanted to do this is because I already knew that the Detection algorithms, the anomaly detection algorithms are working well on data sets coming from different domains. And this was a data from another domain, right? So let's apply this, okay? So I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it, but uh, just so that you get the flavor of how we solve the problem. One is, um, I gave you the example of the taxi problem, right? Where, where what you were trying to do, you're doing a sort of a, 
half cooked, semi cooked optimization problem, where you don't get to the exact solution, but you get to a good enough approximation. That is an optimization problem. And now in literature, with some of these some of these methods, like for example, this isolation forest and k means, these are examples of clustering algorithms. Do you understand what a clustering algorithm is? How many of you are familiar with clustering algorithms? One, two. Okay, so what do we do in clustering algorithms? We get rid of the levels. We no longer care about the levels and we want to see if I create groups, right? Whether I can create groups which contain similar objects, right? And from within one group to another group, the dissimilarity has to be really strong. And the way we do that is we use some quantitative measure of some sort of distance functions, like Euclidean distances, you know, Minkowski distance, or Mahalanobis distance, whatever. Right? Okay. So the standard way of doing that. How many clusters to form depends also once again from the domain knowledge, and we try to avoid an even number of clusters. We do always try an odd number of clusters, and so on and so forth. So that was in our mind. If you really think about clustering algorithm, do you, do you think that there is a relationship between optimization and clustering? And if you think so, can you tell me why? That's a general assumption. Yes. Um, uh, right. So when, but that's like when you look at the points within one cluster, right? So when you look at clustering, remember there are multiple clusters. So between the clusters, there is variance, correct? Okay. Within the cluster also there is variance because not all data points are same. They're similar, but not same, right? So there are two types of variances we are trying to optimize when we write an efficient clustering algorithm. One is that within a cluster, there are data points and you try to minimize the distance between those data points, isn't it? Because they are in that cluster because they are similar. And then there are objects or instances in another cluster which are largely dissimilar from the other cluster. So what typically we do, we try to find the centroid of one cluster, try to find the centroid of the other cluster, and we see that we make sure that these distances are as large as possible. So simultaneously, we are solving a minimization problem and a maximization problem. This is once again a non-classical optimization problem. Okay, and very, very similar in nature to the kind of taxi problem that you are trying to solve. Okay, so here is once again, since we are able to solve that taxi problem using that multi-stage mimetic algorithm, I, can I bring this in into this context, right? And then there are data points which belongs to cluster one, cluster two, cluster three, and then there are odd guys, right? Which do not belong to any cluster. And those are the guys we mark as anomalies. Not as simple as that, because before doing that, we also have, have did, a, we used and leveraged a dynamic binary anomaly tree structure, right? Where all the clustering happened on the trees itself, right? Um, and that's for the, um, in, in an engineering side, you may uh, may ignore that. So we call that a binary anomaly tree. A binary tree is the one where you have a parent and two children, right? Now, the idea is this. So this is where the, because I, as I said, I mean, I'm not going to get into the technical nitty gritty of it, but if I have to give you the story of how the things were done, the things were done in the following fashion, because you have a pool of data, right? So I throw all the data at you. So like 4,500 plus exoplanets, right? Okay, I store all of them in the root and then I sweep down the tree. So what I do is that this 4,500 samples, I split it randomly between the two children and then they mutate, they cross over. And then from one sub tree to another sub tree, there is cross cultural evolution, right? And then that's how the tree grows. Now here we have to keep tab of two things that I should not detect anomalies too far from the root because that becomes difficult computationally, right? So I put a heuristic saying that for the total tree level or the tree height that I have, right? The half of the tree height within that I have to detect all the anomalies. Okay, that's a heuristic. Does that heuristic apply always? Possibly no, right? But these are criteria so that your computational algorithm does not go out of hand. It's like you have to be able to handle it, right? Both in terms of space, complexity, and speed, okay? So 
So we create the trees and then we start clustering. So each node of your tree actually has a bunch of data points. So within those nodes, you are clustering. Okay. And there is a small cluster. So the idea is, in our case, the idea was there's a large cluster, there's a small cluster. And because these clusters are actually not complete matrix spaces, we could not use the Euclidean distance or the standard distance matrix. We had to design our own distance matrix. Okay, which is enhanced cluster outlier factor. Okay, I mean, so, and then um, we do did this recursively over and over and over again, and finally get to a point, which is a leaf. Leaf meaning at that particular point, that particular node is not able to reproduce. That's it. It cannot mutate, it cannot cross over. And also at that particular node, there is just one data instance. And that one is an anomaly. So that's where the algorithm stops. Okay, so it's an amalgamation of several moving pieces together, and then eventually we extended that algorithm to time series data sets as well, but that's not the subject of today's talk. So, therefore, these are the properties of the anomaly and the algorithms you can. So, this is how, I mean, if I have to give a high level um, sort of representation of how the method works, this is how the method works. So, when you see D1, this particular instance, this is a leaf node, right? And as you can see, it cannot split further. Right, and also here you will see there is only one data instance. Every other node, even some of the other nodes which are probably at the same level in the tree, are not flagged as anomalies, even though they are same level because they have multiple data instances. We wanted to detect the outliers, segregate out the outliers. Why so, only two? Because, because it's a binary tree structure, so it splits only that way. I mean, this is once again a heuristic motion with you because you can have some other weird uh, structures of trees, but then it becomes very difficult for us to control the algorithm. Okay. Based on the heuristic, because it has to, sorry. Yeah, because it has to contain one data instance and it has to be a leaf, right? Okay, and it has to be within one half of the entire tree level. These are the three heuristics that determine whether a point is outlier or not together. Right? Because it's based on the principle that we detect anomalies one by one. You cannot detect anomalies in a cluster, a bunch. So you first pick one data point, detect it as an anomaly, then you repeat this. Okay. You detect that anomaly, pull that data set, data point out, out of your data set, and then rerun your algorithm and see. These are called the heuristics. Yes. Heuristics. And the data set has to follow either a Gaussian or a Rayleigh distribution, which most data sets do follow. Right? I mean, I mean, I don't know. I haven't found any data, data set yet which does not follow either of the two. Probably. That is the Arrival pattern, right? Not the that's the arrival pattern. So when, like for even for a queuing system, it's possible. Even for a queuing system, it's POSA, right? But we are not trying to detect anomalies in a queuing system. So we are looking at the data as an aggregation, because as I told you, we put all the data, the entire volume of data in one node on top, okay? Anyway, uh, so these are the other So these are examples of, so you are familiar with AWS, right? The Amazon Web Services, they have all these servers. So they have, uh, you know, a faulty hard drive. So their anomaly data set is like try to detect, I give you the log data, you tell me which one of my hard drives is faulty. Okay, um, so uh, we did that and all of that, I mean, I'll skip the math. Um, there are other important mathematical characteristics as well. But if you ask me, um, the other good thing about this anomaly detection algorithm is, we designed our own clustering algorithm, but instead of that, if we fit in any standard clustering algorithm into our anomaly detection method, it still works well. And that's the reason we call it D. D stands for dynamic. Okay, so it is flexible with any, any clustering algorithm, not only the one that we designed. Okay, uh, these are all the industrial data sets you may not be able to. So sensitivity and specificity will tell you that whether you are able to flag anomalies correctly and whether you are able to flag 
I mean, whether you are um, you are generating, are you generating false flags? Like instances which are not anomalous, you are telling them, no, no, this is an anomaly. Okay. So in, in, by both parameters, our methods are state of the art. Okay. Irrespective of more or less, as I said, as you move along this, so this is one clustering algorithm not written by us. This is another clustering algorithm not written by us. This is another clustering algorithm written by someone else. So instead of our method, if we plug in any one of these three clustering algorithms, the performance remains similar. So this was the benchmark which gave us the confidence to take that method to other data sets. Okay. And we applied it on credit card data sets and a bunch of other stuff. And then you know, I'll skip that. I already told you this. Um, so I'll just take you straight to the results. Mm, yeah. So you can see um, we applied this. So the last one, the last one is the one that is multi stage mimetic binary tree anomaly identified. MS This is the one that we proposed. Okay. Now, what happens was uh, so when we so this is based on the EC block score, right? Uh, these are the ones not defined by us. These are these are actually clustered purity matrices defined by someone else. But when we compare the part, we will use that as well. But when I when I take this EC block or some other other methods. Uh, what we see is that when we compare it to other methods, the scores vary rapidly. Like it starts from eight and goes all the way to 1600. So we determined based on the smallest range of variation for the anomaly score, right? And if you look here, you will see that you compare the last row. So this is the range is from 14 to 654, right? Compare that with others. The ranges are much higher. So this is the measure of the statistical confidence that you will be able to detect anomalies. Okay. Now there are two sets of data. The first was the original data set, which was already there in the PHLC, right? But then when we looked at the data carefully, there are a bunch of data points where the gravity, you know, density, escape velocity, these were not there. Okay. So we deleted those data points and then we curated another data set, which we call as D2. And that data set has 706 exoplanets on it. Okay, we ran our method on both. And when we do that, and, uh, on the first data set, um, I think we got about 44 anomalous instances, including Earth. And when we ran the method on the second data set, D2, which has only 706 planets, the anomalous instances were turned out to be six, including Earth. And then we cross checked with the potentially habitable and the optimistic set of habitable exoplanets, there is a 90% or so match. Okay. This does not mean that we have detected exoplanets. What I'm just trying to tell you is that uh, we are able to sort of match with what the physicists have saying. Okay. So if their inferences are wrong and biased, the, the algorithm outcome is also wrong and biased. Okay. Just anomalous. It has to be anomalous according to the definition of anomaly that we define. That it has to be there primarily, and it has to contain a very small fraction of the entire data set. That's it. For example, if you have a hmm. that's I can give you another example. The, the gas charge of us, nucleotide, far off from the host, but uh, very small and therefore not detected directly by transit. And most of the chat blocks are based on this. Mm -hmm. It's very rare, simply because the signal is so small that it has gone below the threshold of the entire territory. So now, you know, that raises a question about whether that can be. No, but but when you say rare, is it rare as in it is a small fraction of the total set of data, or is it rare because the instances are rare? The collection of that is the data that you get. Huh, and that's right. Okay. 
course. There should be a protection of instrumental thresholds. That's the kind of operation mm -hmm. for which you've been observing. The right, operation. right. So, you know, taking these two factors into account, it is very rare that, you know, a planet smaller than Mercury may not be easy to detect. Significant no. smaller than Mercury. No, but that, that, may not be detectable. But that's not, not, not talking about like saying that there's already 5,000 planets. Some of them are not labeled as habitable for planets. This algorithm can pull them out and show them. Yeah, but what I'm trying to tell you is selection bias has existed. See, if, if there is selection bias in data, okay, if there is selection bias in data, huh, of course, the algorithm cannot auto correct that bias. That's not what algorithms do. But if you're asking if my algorithm is biased towards the data, the answer is no, okay, because that's not how we design algorithms. So if, it depends on your input. So in my case, the input was the catalog that we got from PHLSE, right? And we also made sure that, you know, at least we have a curated set of planets where we have the information about all the physical parameters at least, not blanks, because I was not willing to, you know, impute data. Um, yeah, yeah. Understood, understood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, if you have a hot star, the habitable zone is going to be farther out. Right. But a cold star or some type of star is going to be nearby. Right. So, so physics is not that difficult. Right. So, I, I don't see why it's going to be a very large. I think that we were the argument, for example, take a Mars like uh, planet, a Mercury, atmosphere is drastically different from us. Then we would not expect this. So, for example, there's no water. Take moon, take the Earth moon system. The moon is at the same, approximately the same, you know, Earth and moon are approximately at the same distance from the sun. But the moon has a different mass as far as the atmosphere. You can argue that there would be no habitability on the moon. And for that, we would need to go to the sun. So, in that sense, I agree that there would what I'm trying to stress over here is that your data has a huge selection bias. Of, of course. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm the one who has not created the data. Yeah. So the question is, if you give me the data with smaller number of features, larger number of features, the method will work. For sure. I mean, for sure. Right. And, and that's where we I think the I mean, people like us need to work with people like you, because then you, we get the context, right? Like, like what sort of data to use. Because right now, at this point of time, now that the catalog is gone, I actually don't know which data set to use. Kepler must be having a data. NASA exoplanet. NASA exoplanet, yes. Yeah. yeah. And also, I was thinking, I was telling Swastik that. But I'm not saying that, right? My algorithm is not saying whether it is within the habitable zone or not. What it's saying is, can it, what, it, what my algorithm tries to do is to pick instances which are rare statistically from the rest of the population. So what is it to any kind of anomaly in these parameters that you see? Yeah, just to yes. make that it's yes. there. It's there. Right. Yes. I'm not detecting, my algorithm does not detect per se whether it is within the habitable zone or not. No, that's not what we are doing. We're not doing that. That's more probable. So it's like a, it's like a, you can give a probability score to each one of these detected instances. It's a purely statistical exercise. So when you say my hard drive is faulty, right? You don't know anything about that. You just, you just feed the odd guy out by, by doing the statistical, you know, by analyzing the statistical distribution, whether you have a set of like four features or 40 features doesn't matter. That matter. The method will work. So that particular parameter in question, we are not using it. Uh, you want to finish the talk? Or... Yeah. So the result is that, see, the result largely depends on the conjecture, right? I'm saying that the rare instances, meaning habitable instances. This is the conjecture, right? And and the empirics say that when I determine the rare instances, which are about like 44, right? When I take the full catalog and about six, 
which when I take the partial catalog, right, that's a subset of the planet candidates that are identified by people as potentially habitable or optimistically habitable. So all candidates are identified by the Yes, 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 right. I mean, because I, we just did a cross match with what Abel and his colleagues say, right? Okay. I mean, based on, I mean, I, among these six, definitely Earth is there. That's what I'm stressing, stressing part again and again, right? And it contains some other planets which are, I, I, I'm pretty sure I have to check, but those are within the habitable zone as well. But we did not use that while clustering. That particular parameter we did not use. No, but whether they are detected more or less doesn't matter. I mean, by my definition of anomaly is this: that I give you a set of ten thousand data points, right? Out of which certain data points are, you know, very very dissimilar with the rest of the group. That is my definition of anomaly. Yeah, but then there are so many several parameters. But we do not measure anomalies based on one feature only, right? I mean, that's not that's not how that's not how the data centric algorithms work. We measure anomalies based on multiple features. It's a multivariate distance that we compute all the time. So, yes, to some extent, to some extent, yes. In the feature space, in the reduced feature space, we look for the um, orthogonal ligand vectors. Yes, yes, right. Yeah. So it's not. Yeah. That is an interesting experiment. We haven't done it, but you, you give me good ideas. So let me let me tell you this. Okay. I mean, because since there are no I there are no since this is a meta heuristic based method, I do not have theoretical results on the convergence of the algorithm or the correctness. What we did was, uh, and this is not only on the exoplanet database only. Let's say I you there is an anomaly data set. Okay. I know that these are the data points which are anomalous because they are flat. Of course, I'm removing those levels before I run my algorithm. So what I do is I remove all the anomalous flagged instances from that data set. Now what? It becomes a normal data instance. You have a set of data points which have no anomalies, supposedly, right? Run a, we ran our algorithm on those data points. And if my algorithm is correct, the, what should be the outcome? Zero anomalies, right? Correct. And that is what turned out to be the case. So we did that on multiple things, but we did not experiment by reducing the number of parameters or increasing the number of parameters as far as the exoplanet database is concerned. So you can do a weighting scheme of the parameters, right? While defining while defining the EC block, which is basically a distance. Semi-metric distance between two data points. You can do that. That's fine. We can. You can do it. I mean, that's easy to do. Like even for Euclidean distance, that's the same problem that we encounter, right? So people use weighted Euclidean distances, and people sometimes use Mohorovic distances because they do not capture the orientation in the feature space correctly. So that's how different distance measures exist. Yes. Oh, Vagish was also asking. Yes. Rather than having multiple parameters and reducing the number of parameters, let's see you have a large number of data sets and multiple anomalies in that, and then you have a small number of data sets. 
Oh, excellent. Yeah. Both cases, yes. So since we detected, that's the whole purpose of generalization ability, right? That's the test bed of generalization ability. So when we do this, typically in machine learning, what we do is we start with small data sets, right? Start with small data sets, small anomalies. Then large data sets, small anomalies. Large data sets and slightly, sorry, slightly larger number of anomalies, right? So we did that. So the different data sets, like for example, the AWS, it has like four anomalies in 1.5 million instances. Right, but the Yahoo data set has about 3000 data instances, if my memory serves me right, and about 23 anomalies. So these are not uniform. And the good thing for us is that because since we did not create the data sets, the heterogeneity of the data set was a given. Because you apply to the data sets from industrial systems, you took the data sets from non industrial systems as well, like credit card fraud and other things, spending patterns and so on. So largely, yes. So we also tested on just like we removed all the normal instances from the data set. But then we had a really small data set with like seven anomalies and ran it, ran the algorithm. The algorithm was able to detect not all, because you see it requires some, you know, iterations and, you know, uh, recursions, right? And it was able to detect four out of seven, three out of seven and so on and so forth. Right. We can do that. We haven't done it yet, but we'll definitely be happy to do it. In fact, I will give you the see that the code is on GitHub. The code is on GitHub. I'll give you the code you run it, you know, and let me know what happens. It's pretty simple. Yes. I think Pidogra was wanting to ask a question. So about the algorithm itself, can you detect an anomaly? Let me give you an example. Suppose an observer. Has uh, you know observations of four several years from a certain instrument. Right? The trouble is the instrument has degraded over time, and as a result, it appears as if instrumental prop what could have been an instrumental property at one time can end up being erroneously distinguished as a sky property at that point. Okay. Now, so you were saying you were saying the noise, yeah. the noise, yeah. and yeah. So this method is not completely robust to noise, but we can design a distance function which is robust to noise and therefore can alleviate some of the problems that you mentioned. So basically, if the observer wants to observe observations which are the same time, retain observations which are not correct, they will not be able to detect the same. See, labels, we cannot do anything. Uh, Fioza, no, because labels, this, this method does not work on label data. It's only worked on unlabeled data. No. This is because primarily because of the noise, right? Yeah, I get it. I get your question. So to, uh, to uh, the answer to your question is a pars partial affirmation, okay? Because I know since we are using a bunch of different heuristics to actually appear, you know, arrive at the final anomaly, some of the noise inflicted anomalies would be taken care of. I am not sure whether it will take care of everything. I'll have to get back to you on that. In fact, it will be immensely useful if you send me such a data set. Right, and then I'll let me run. And if possible, we need to make I need to make some alterations in our method as well. But between the precision and the speed up, I think on the speed up side we are slightly lagging. This is a slightly slower algorithm. So I mean that's one of the you know yeah okay. I mean I think that yeah we are yeah yeah sure. Normalize what? Normalize across the features, yes. If you use normal distance, if you use modern distance, you don't need to do that. It takes care of that automatically. And that's, yeah. Right. Right. So, if you try to give features 
This because our method is agnostic to such things. We designed the enhanced cluster outlier factor in such a way that it is agnostic to such large variances in feature weight. We are not using, using Euclidean distance. Not, we use EC bluff. We don't use it. When I, as I said, also, because that is when we use our algorithm within the element injection method. If I take away our algorithm and plug in k-means, then of course you are using Euclidean distance. And if when you do that, you of course then have to look at the feature importance. Otherwise, this will not work. Certainly. Yes. Mm -hmm. And for the analogs, uh, objective that anomaly and all that. Right. And you are connecting that anomaly to the heritage. That is the conjecture, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, because of the multi-parameter space, you are likely to have more anomalous set of uh, structure on heritage views. How about a data set which has more than one anomaly of different kinds? Different kinds. Right now, you are only pointing out one, which you are calling it as that. Usually the anomaly detection algorithms, whether in astronomy or outside astronomy, when they detect anomaly, the context is set. Like as I was giving an example, like your spending pattern, right? So your spending pattern, when, when the spending pattern is the test bet, you detect anomalies based on your spending pattern only. If you add spending pattern and something else, uh, geography, ge demographic distribution, and things like that, the problem complexity exponentially increases. Yeah. Right. So that's the anomaly in some sense. Mm -hmm. You don't know why it happens. Theory that most of these Jupiter and the Sun here they get about so little photo. Right. So that's so something is missing there, and that is that to me is the anomaly. So why your algorithm should have detected that anomaly too, along with those other abilities? There could be several anomalies. That's what I'm saying. Understood. I understood your question. So that you want my method to discover different types of anomalies at one go. Right? Should, yeah. ah, right. I mean, well, don't say it should. Usually, anomaly detection algorithms don't. Okay? But they just, no, no anomaly algorithm does that. I mean, show me one example. Show me one example of an anomaly algorithm which does that. If you want the method to do it, then you have to use a sort of a weighted distance function. So, several distance functions or a weighted loss function, each defined for each of the context. Then, possibly, the method will be able to. Detects not only one type of anomaly, but other type of anomalies as well. Yeah, generally that's so that's what people do. But if the context changes, or if you add context to it, to in answer to Swastik's question, is that then your distance, both your distance function and loss function, needs to be redesigned, which people do all the time. But that is also, once again, a heuristic. There are no theoretical guarantees that it will give you this much precision, probabilistically speaking. Okay? But people people work on that. Like, for example, adversarial attack. You have a panda bear, and you just you know splash a white uh, paint on its nose, right? You know, sorry, you have a black bear, and you splash white paint, and then suddenly your method starts uh, you know identifying it as a panda. That's not true, right? So such effects, yes. In the supervised setting, Firoza, many of those problems have been solved. I mean, not the, the noise problem, but in the unsupervised solve setting, it's much more difficult to solve. So, what is your question? Supervision means? No, no, no. Supervision means that there are, let's say, there are two classes of data points, right? And then somehow you are able to figure out, you meaning a human, right? Or in the case of a machine. You are somehow able to figure out that if I draw a straight line with certain slope, then that straight line will be able to split the data points of one type from the data points of the other, right? And you, why we say it's a supervised model? Because 
this particular decision surface is arrived based on the supervision, supervised training of thousands of instances before. Okay, thousands of training instances before. You have a history. In the case of, particularly in the case of our algorithm, we do not require any training data or a training phase. It just does everything on the fly, which is why it's also slower on the slower side. Yes. At the back. I think there was someone who wanted to ask you, and then I'll turn to you. Yeah. No, I'm not a physicist, so sorry for the confusion. I don't know. I'm not confusing that. I never said. I never said that this is like a. This is like a theorem. What, I, what I'm saying is, I'll repeat what I said twice at least during my talk. Is that the extension from industrial and non-industrial anomalies to exoplanets is a test of how well my method generalizes. So what my method does is it flashes out a bunch of anomalous instances. I am claiming them to be habitable, okay? And the way I validate my claim is to compare that list that the algorithm flashes out with the list of potentially habitable or optimistic exoplanets. That's it. That's where it ends. Okay, I'm not saying that, okay, because it, no, no algorithm can do that, right? Then you guys come in, the physicist, okay, and add context to it, you know, which is, I think, probably Ravinder was, Ravinder, right? Is what Ravinder was alluding to. I mean, if you give us the context, we can recalibrate the algorithm and probably make a more reliable prediction. But in terms of the correctness of the prediction, I'm almost almost sure that it, you know, from a, purely from a data centric point of view, the predictions are correct because we ran it multiple times, repeated this system multiple multiple times, and we compute the mean accuracy and the standard deviation over 50 runs. And our objective is to have the standard deviation within 0 0.05 so that, you know, the, the accuracy that we are reporting at one run is actually sort of has a high probability of being repeated when you run it independently later. So those are some of the statistical robustness things that people have to do anyway. Yes. Yeah, so uh, you said like you had a criteria like uh, anomaly detection has to happen half in. That's a heuristic, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, like, what led to that? Ah, that, that's a good question. So, what we did was when we initially tested on a bunch of data sets, what we observed was a shabby shape type inequality, which is, which says that, you know, regarding the tree height. Okay. So, when we ran a bunch of experiments, we saw that in most of the times, and this is pure empirics, like your, you know, t test or something, right? We saw that that tree height growing beyond a certain level. So we, what we did was we ran this test on a bunch of data points and a bunch of different uh, instances, and we recorded the tree heights, right? And then we also recorded the average tree height, okay? And then we saw whether the Chebyshev, what does the Chebyshev inequality say? It says that if you go farther from the mean, right, the probability of going farther from the mean will reduce drastically by one over some constant. Okay, and that's exactly what we observed. After we did several experimentations, now you, you may say, well, this particular thing may change if we do more expectation possibly, but from the point of view of statistical sufficiencies, we have tested enough, and then we knew that for all the different instances, so we have 15 plus 31, 46 different training sets like different data sets which i think is pretty comprehensive okay apart from the exoplanet and out of all 46 when we ran this we saw that the average height is this okay and the departure standard deviation from the upper height by a large margin that probability is 0 0.05 or even smaller so that led to this heuristic what probably do like you can count how many that one particular layer, how many of them are single and how many are like Yes, I mean, but as I said, even if the nodes are even if the nodes are single, right? I mean yeah. that itself will not be a marker for anomaly because that particular singleton node has to be also within the one half of the tree height. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, well, we do, of course. I mean, if um, probably, you know, this is this is from the, I mean, from the industry side is a hot problem. I mean, if you now read the literature, you will see thousands and thousands of everybody is doing animal detection. Okay. I claim that this is state of the art because based on the existing benchmarks, we are doing the best. Okay. But however, the best is still, it can never be perfect. Right. Any prediction algorithm which tells you it's, it gives you a hundred percent prediction algorithm, I'll be skeptical. I will not. I will not believe that. It just doesn't happen. Yeah. yeah. It will depend on the data size. So the trade-off between the data size and the which is the problem size, we call this a problem size and the precision. So um, and the uh, speed up. So within this, uh, you, I think you guys are familiar with the no free lunch theorem, right? So, uh, so the, so there is no free lunch. So, but our focus was precision. So, in order to achieve high precision, we compromised on the speed up side, but not on the data set side. Yeah. No, no, let him finish the question. Sorry. Habitability is somewhat anomalous now. But as we accumulate more and more data, large amount of data, habitability is no more anomalous. Right. So so when you when you check something and uh, it somehow depend on the data size. Probably yes, yes, of course. As I said, it's like has to be less than 10% because that's the standard definition of anomaly. That your rare instances by rare, you may see, look at the Gaussian. What happens at Gaussian? That 95% of your data is captured between from the mean, right? Within three standard deviations from the mean. What happens outside that? What happens? So when those this is after three or even three. Yes. No, I don't think his question has to do it. I mean, it depends on how you are defining noise. The way you are defining noise in an earlier question, I think it's different from what he is alluring to. So typically, if you are saying that now I have 10,000 data points and five anomalies, and that's a good data set, and now I have increased the data set size, like the 10,000 has become a million, and that five has become 500. That's okay. Still, as long as that ratio is maintained, then the method will work. As I said in the beginning of my talk, if you recall that, and somebody asked me this question, if 40% of my data point is anomalous, let's say, then this method will work, obviously. And that's not an anomaly detection problem at all, right? That's a class imbalance problem, yes. Six six are all I never said the six are habitable. I said that they are cross matched with the potentially habitable nest. Okay. So you have associated how many are missing the habitable nest? Means your algorithm is missing. Um, um, what do you mean? How many are missing? Other than um, exoplanets also that are habitable nest. Your algorithm is not. Might have missed it, yes. Of course. Of course. I should. And that's how I did. So when I reported this particular method, I never said my algorithm is like 100% correct. I said my reporting claim was, so this is the set which we found as anomalous and therefore potentially habitable. And these are the potentially habitable list of exoplanets by these and these guys, right? Obviously there is a mismatch, right? Okay. When I apply this on industrial data sets, my, my metrics and measures are different. When I apply this to an exoplanet data set, my metrics and measures are different. Okay. Yes. Everything, everything that's there, yeah. Mm -hmm.
you need to go a uh, whole lot through Twitter. So in that case, my data set will be aged. It's, 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 yeah, so that can be turned into a numerical one and then uh, oh yes, both both numerical and categorical as well, of course. I mean that is also pretty standard. I mean everybody does that. It's no big deal. It's okay. <laughs> but thank you. 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 Thank you.